When devices are fabricated in integrated circuits, you have components that are very close to each other. That often results in things like parasitic capacitances. In this video, we're going to talk about the Miller effect. Basically, the Miller effect says that if you have an inverting amplifier, then it makes these parasitics worse. It makes the parasitic capacitances larger than what they would otherwise be. Now, how big are these parasitic capacitances typically? Well, I'm going to use the 2N2222 transistor. It's an NPN transistor just to illustrate the kind of magnitude values that you could expect. Between the base and the collector, the data sheet says we have about 8 picofarads. And between the base and the emitter, it looks like we have about 25 picofarads. So just from these values, you might think, well, the 25 picofarad case is worse. Larger capacitances are worse because they form filters. But in this case, it tends to actually be the 8 picofarad capacitance that's worse. Because there is usually an inversion between the base and the collector. For example, if you use a common emitter configuration and you have the input at the base, then the output's going to be inverted relative to the input if you take it at the collector. That means that the Miller effect comes into play. Let's take a look why that's the case. I'm going to start here with an idealized amplifier. I'm going to assume that the input impedance is infinite and that the output impedance is zero. I'm going to assume that we have a capacitor that's strung between the input side of the amplifier and the output side of the amplifier. So typically the Z in this box would represent a capacitor. The impedance of a capacitor is 1 divided by j omega c. We'll go through the calculations, though, using the letter z. My intention is to transform this circuit into an equivalent circuit where there is no capacitor connecting the input to the output. I'm going to label this impedance as z sub m, the Miller impedance. The question here is what impedance z sub m would result in the same arrangement of voltages and currents in the resulting circuit. It's not very hard to do the derivation. The job of the amplifier is just take the constant A and multiply it times the voltage at the input side. That's certainly the case here on the left, but it's also going to be the case in my equivalent circuit here on the right. I now want to look at the currents, and we'll call this current I sub S, since that's the current coming out of the source. If the amplifier is ideal, then none of that current branches off here into the amplifier. It all goes around my capacitance. I can apply Ohm's law across these two resistors. V equals IR applied across my source resistance gives me a voltage drop and a resistance R sub S. That's basically just an equation for my source current. And if I apply the same rule across impedance Z, then I have V minus my output voltage divided by impedance Z. Let's split up the fraction and rewrite this. And when I get to my output voltage, I'm going to substitute in for my first equation. Let's now rearrange it so that all the V's are on the left and the V sub S is on the right. We can now factor out a V from the left side and invert all the signs. Let's now move V sub S over to the left, and we'll move all of these over to the right denominator. And I'm going to combine these terms so that the Z only appears once. I now want to multiply everything times Z divided by 1 minus A. So let's multiply our numerator times Z over 1 minus A. And then here in our denominator, the r's cancel for the first term, and we're going to multiply it times z over 1 minus a. And then for our second term, we're just going to get our s. This looks a lot like a voltage divider. And by inspection, I can define this term as my Miller impedance, z sub m. And it appears down here in the denominator, too. You see, with this definition, I can rewrite this expression Zm divided by Zm plus R sub S. If you look at this portion of our circuit, we can see that this voltage is indeed Zm divided by Rs plus Zm. The two circuits are identical. They give the same voltage. What happens here on the right side of the circuit now? 
Well, we effectively have current added to this node in the circuit. So I'm going to have to come up with something where we have current flowing in. And the current flowing in is I sub s. That current adds to whatever current we have coming out of the amplifier and flows into our load resistor. In order to continue, I'm going to rewrite the rightmost expression here of I sub s. V is V out over A, and I'm going to leave everything else unchanged. I'm now going to take that expression and rewrite it over here. When I do that, I'm going to factor out V out. What I can do now is notice that 1 over A minus 1 is going to be a negative number. If it's a negative number, it means that my current source is pointed in the wrong direction. What I can do then, if the current is actually flowing down rather than up, is replace that controlled source by a simple resistor. Let's redraw the entire circuit in order to take care of that. We'll call that resistance Z2. Minus IS flows down through Z2. Applying Ohm's law across Z2, I can say that V equals IR. V is the output voltage, V out. I is minus I sub S, and then our impedance is Z2. If we combine these two equations together, we can conclude that Z2 is Z divided by 1 minus 1 over A. Now that we have expressions for the Miller impedance Z sub M and Z2, what do they mean? Well, if we consider that we have a capacitor, a hypothetical capacitor connecting the input side of a circuit to the output side of a circuit with impedance 1 divided by j omega c, then the Miller impedance is going to have a different expression. It's going to appear to the circuit as if the impedance is 1 divided by j omega c times 1 minus a. We could call c times 1 minus a the Miller capacitance, c sub m. So you see what happens. If the gain of your amplifier A is large and it's negative, then it means that the capacitor is going to appear to the circuit to be a much larger capacitor. The larger your gain, the worse the situation becomes. How about for Z2? What does a capacitor that straddles between the input and the output do to the output side? Well, we need to divide by 1 minus 1 over A. I could call this value down here C2. Because A is in the denominator here, and A is a number typically larger than 1 in a practical amplifier, then this is less of a concern on the output side. On the other hand, what happens if A is positive? Is it going to be a concern if A is positive? Well, if you kind of look at the expression for C sub M in terms of C, if A is a positive number, then it can actually be negative. What that means is that the capacitor starts to look like an inductor, and it's not going to be a concern anymore if you're worried about having a filter in your circuit. To sum it up, the Miller effect mainly causes parasitic capacitances to appear worse. Let's look at an example. In this example, we have a common emitter amplifier. We're told that this capacitor has a parasitic capacitance of 8 picofarads between the base and collector. That's the one we're worried about because we have an inversion of the signal between the base and the collector. First, let's do a DC analysis. We have a power supply voltage of 9, and I see two 10 kilo ohm resistors. We have an easy voltage divider here, and we're going to end up with half of the power supply voltage at the base. If I subtract 0.7, then I can find what the DC voltage is at the emitter. It's 3.8 volts. Since we have a 1 kilo ohm resistor down here attached to the emitter, all of the emitter current is going to flow through it. The emitter current is then 3.8 milliamps. My emitter resistor, little r sub e, can be estimated as 26 divided by my emitter resistance expressed in milliamps. That works out to be 6.8 ohms in this problem. We now have enough information to find the gain of this circuit. We can almost do it by inspection. First, for the input side, we have 5 kilo ohms 
For our gain, we have first an input divider, and I'm not going to include the impedance looking into the base of the transistor. Instead, I'm going to include it in my denominator for the gain. You can only use impedance reflection once. Then for our gain expression, we're going to have our resistance attached to the collector, 1K in parallel with 1K. That's this resistor and this resistor. And then here in the denominator, we have the resistances attached to the emitter. And we need all of them because I truncated my input impedance over here. So for the base, we have 100 in parallel with 10 kilo ohms, in parallel with 10 kilo ohms. And we're going to reflect that over to the emitter side by dividing it by beta. That's in series with R sub E, and then that's attached to an AC ground. So the gain works out to be about minus 63. That's very typical for a gain of a common emitter amplifier when you're shorting the emitter resistor like that. Now how about the Miller effect? Well, the capacitor goes between the input and the output. So I want to know what capacitor does it resemble if it were attached directly to ground. So I want to replace that 8 picofarad capacitor with an equivalent Miller capacitance that goes directly to ground. That makes it easier to calculate the effects of that capacitor on the high frequency performance of the filter. We just calculated that the Miller capacitance is C times 1 minus A. So we'll plug in 8 picofarads for C. And then our gain is minus 63. So let's substitute in minus 63. We wind up here with 512 picofarads. Not very good, is it? Let's now kind of redraw the input side of the circuit to make it clear what kind of filter we're dealing with here. There's our source, and our source impedance here is 100 ohms. We have a 100 nanofarad capacitor. We then have two 10 kilo ohm resistors in parallel with one another. We then have our Miller capacitance, which is 512 picofarads here. And then we have our resistance looking into the base of that transistor, which is just R sub E times beta. The beta is there, of course, because of impedance reflection. What we have here to the right of the 100 nanofarad capacitor is the true input impedance to the circuit. The 100 nanofarad capacitor is in series with the source, or it's in series with the signal, so it's going to form a high-pass filter with the rest of the circuit. The corner frequency of that high-pass filter is going to be so low that it's never going to block the signal at 10 kilohertz. I'm basically just going to ignore it then. To see what effect the 512 picofarad capacitor has on our circuit, I'm going to rearrange things just a little bit. I'm going to put the 512 picofarad capacitor over here on the right, and then I'm going to slide the beta RE to the left of it. And I can do that because they're just in parallel with one another. Let's combine the two 10 kilo ohm resistors into one, and I'm going to short circuit the 100 nanofarad capacitor. You see, because of the configuration or the location of the 512 picofarad capacitor, it looks like a low-pass filter here, not a high-pass filter. In order to know what resistance to use when calculating the corner frequency of this low-pass filter, I can just find the Thevenin equivalent resistance. It's just going to be beta RE in parallel with 5 kilo ohms in parallel with 100 ohms. It works out to be 86 ohms in this particular example. Finally, I have a simple low-pass filter. Now, the Thevenin voltage is not the same as the signal voltage, but the frequency is not going to be altered. For that reason, I'm not going to bother to calculate it. The corner frequency of this low-pass filter, when I plug in 512 picofarads for the capacitor, and 86 ohms for the resistor works out to be 3.6 megahertz. Since our circuit is operating here at 10 kilohertz, then I can conclude that the Miller effect is not a concern here. Although the Miller effect wasn't much of a concern in that particular example, I think you can see that these parasitic capacitances can be amplified when you're using an inverting amplifier. But what can we do if we need to have that inversion? How can we mitigate the Miller effect?
In the next video, I'm going to talk about a circuit configuration or an amplifier configuration called the cascode. What it is, is a combination of a common emitter amplifier and a common base amplifier. Working together, you can basically mitigate the Miller effect.